You see, son, when a Bloodborne loves a Kingsfield very much, sometimes they want to express their love in a special way. So they spend mommy-daddy time together, and Odin blesses them with a baby. And then they lose that baby and yearn for a surrogate. And that surrogate is a fan project made on PlayStation Dreams named Yarnum's Field. I was playing some Souls-inspired fan games on Dreams the other day, wading through a lot of schlock and having a decent time with some others. Then I booted a very special game. I believe the 19th game that I launched that day? It's called Yarnum's Field, and the description is very simple. Kingsfield in the world of Bloodborne. Bet. I got about 10 minutes in before realizing this was far more advanced than the typical half-complete demos that you see on Dreams. By 20 minutes, I realized I was playing a full, functional, and most importantly, very fun Bloodborne fan game, and I knew that I had to make this video to share this amazing project with y'all. In order to play it, you need a PlayStation 4 or 5 and a copy of Dreams. Dreams is on the PlayStation Store for 20 bucks normally and regularly goes on sale for 8, and physical copies are also pretty cheap. If you don't know Dreams, Dreams is a game creation platform native to the PlayStation with a really powerful set of creation tools and a passionate community of makers. You don't have to be a creator to enjoy it though. Owning a copy of Dreams allows you to play any of the games anyone else has made inside of Dreams too. You might recognize Dreams from 2020. It came out at the beginning of the Pando, and a lot of the early coverage had YouTubers playing through cursed garbage meme vomit levels like Waluigi and Peter Griffin doing terrorism or whatever. There's, there's so much of that on the platform. But there's also hidden gems. Yarnum's Field, at the time I played, has only been played by 60 people worldwide, and it's just too lovingly made for this to go unnoticed. I personally want to make sure this game gets archived, at least in a video, since who knows how long the Dream servers stay online, or if it even gets delisted for some reason. The game is only 1-2 to two hours long, so let's hop right in. The main menu shows our character walking into Yarnum with no prompt other than to press X to play. This is a dark game, y'all, and it could have used a gamma slider at least. I'll do my best in editing, but please give me some grace. The least visible sections of this game are, unfortunately, right at the start. You gain control outside Yosefka's clinic in a safe courtyard for checking out the controls. It's immediately clear how charmingly faithful this game is to the source material. It's like, cute, simplified Yarnum with Kingsfield control scheme. Pretty accurate to what it said on the tin. We've got blood vials and we've got quicksilver bullets. Square attacks. It looks like we have a sock cleaver which cannot be tricked or the option to fight unarmed. L1 and R1 are for strafing as in Kingsfield and triangle is to heal as in Bloodborne. You hold L2 to aim your pistol like an FBS but it's still square to fire it which feels kind of awkward. I stepped forward recognizing the big gate that you usually open as the central Yarnum title card appears and my jaw dropped. This is the most detailed and faithful environment in any soul's dream by a long shot. Now, I'll point out that these beautiful buildings and props, they were not made by the person who created Yarnum's Field. The way Dreams works is very object-oriented, like Legos. One person might make gothic buildings, another might create an animated rat enemy, someone else might provide music. The creator of this dream gathers all those assets, assembles the levels and writes the game logic, sprinkles some magic in, and creates any additional OC that they need. Now, I don't mean to shortchange the creator here, only to emphasize that there is more than one artist at work. These glowing orange flames were immediately recognizable as item pickups. This first one had two blood vials. Then a few steps later, my first combat encounter. Now, one thing Yarnum's Field could benefit from is a tutorial area, or at least they could have made the first encounter be one dude instead of three. I got, at once, a beastly hunter, a torch-wielding hunter who can do a two-hit combo, and a rifleman hanging back taking shots, stripping down to dirty socks. Combat has a learning curve in general, and it also has a learning curve per enemy. There's a general flow you have to get used to that you'll find familiar if you play things like Ultima Underworld and Legend of Grimrock. Or, like, Kingsfield, probably. The basic idea is to kite enemies, alternating attacks with retreating to avoid the enemy's attack. Even understanding those basics going in, Yarnum's Field took some learning. If you try to swing at these hunters as you approach, usually they react quickly and you'll get hit even as you back off. It's better to feint first, baiting their attack to miss before executing your own. The Rifleman in back was the easiest foe of the bunch, since all he took was being circled at close range. Looks like they don't have the 100% drop rate for Quicksilver bullets like they do in Bloodborne though, that's a pity. And I expected the game to end right after this. So many games on this platform do all the work of building a character model, working out the controls, attacks, physics, the enemy AI, to then just lose steam and give you about 50 yards of level before saying thanks for playing my demo and kicking you out to title. Instead, what I see is a big gate. A gate that doesn't open from this side, with a lever on the other, and a whole lot of level beyond that. I see a dark staircase leading upwards, and I'm awestruck. Just how much Yarnum is in my Yarnum's field? 
I head upstairs, walking with a little head bob, and the sound of soft footfalls keeps me immersed. Occasional crow noises punctuate the silence, and I'm ready to swing at the first shadow that moves. Playing in Yarnum in first person is incredible, even such a cutesy minimal recreation of it. Encountering the silhouette of a crate, I optimistically went for an attack, and to my surprise, the crate actually broke open and an item popped out. A whole one bullet. I did not notice more than two crates with items in the whole game, so from a project management perspective, I question if that feature even needed inclusion. The next combat encounter is one beastly hunter and one rifleman, strangely easier than the first encounter in the game. The melee hunter I lure around the corner, baiting him into the one-on-one -on -one arena that is my dark alleyway. The Rifleman isn't too concerned when I step back out of the alley without his friend. He mindlessly pursues the kill, but I grant him his own death. Looking over the edge now, I can see the flame of a tiny item down in the distance. For one moment, I let myself believe that this is an item I missed, but then I realized what the creator is doing. It's the classic Souls move of showing you an item glowing in a faraway area to telegraph, hey, this isn't just background, you'll be going there. The way this game gradually increases its scope and your expectations is masterful. The creator clearly has a good grasp of the Souls formula and game design in general. Despite it being very dark, I always know where to go because there are candles or streetlights highlighting the path, and the combat so far has been challenging but surprisingly balanced. Believe me when I say how rare it is to find satisfying combat in a dreams game. I encounter a red lantern door, which in Bloodborne might signify a friend we can rescue or do a quest for. At least we'd be able to knock on it for some dialogue. Sadly, this aspect of the game did not seem interactive, but it still felt like a cozy oasis in the darkness. Then, two more red lights in the dark, but these ones were moving. A werewolf stalks this street, and his hair was perfect. Because I value staying alive, and I haven't reached anything that felt like a checkpoint or a shortcut, this was my inducement to check out the pistol. Firing a shot takes all my stamina, like a melee attack, but since there's no parry visceral system, my hope is that bullets at least do actual damage. There aren't any damage numbers, but he took about six bullets to kill. That felt expensive, but I don't have any frame of reference for how many bullets we'll get. Maybe six bullets is a good rate for a werewolf. He did get some attacks on me, for which I'm gonna partially blame the dark level, but they actually didn't do that much more damage than the regular hunter foes. I opened the main shortcut gate back to the start of the game that we saw earlier, then entered a wide boulevard that mimics that big main Yarnum Street with its prowling crowds of hunters and burning pyres. There's a pretty big multi-combat here. Now, blood vials so far have been healing me to full, so it doesn't make any sense for me to heal before I absolutely have to, when the next hit would be lethal. This game asks you to carefully manage your healing resource, so there's a little mental game during combat of trying to calculate the differences in hit points before and after an enemy hit you to learn how hard that enemy was hitting for, and then check whether you can tolerate another such hit or if you have to heal right now. The part that stinks about this reactive healing playstyle was that healing actually also takes your full stamina bar, just like attacking does. Maybe this is a Kingsfield holdover, but it slowed down the combat and moved it one step further from the aggressive playstyle of Bloodborne. I don't think I ever died thanks to my inability to heal due to stamina reasons, but I imagine that wouldn't feel good. Up here, I ran into one item pickup that gave me both blood vials and bullets. A welcome gift for sure, but Bloodborne would never. The next corner put me face to face with another werewolf, this time in a nice open graveyard. I decided to duel this one with my cleaver, since I never recovered the bullet spend from last time, and it was surprisingly easy. The easiest enemy in the game, honestly, besides Rifleman. Its lunging grab had such a nice tell and long animation that counterattacking him in melee was no issue. They also do lots of back and forth movement, so with some luck, you don't even need a big arena, just enough light to see their windups. Suddenly, I recognized that I was on the bridge that would normally lead to the Cleric Beast boss fight. Except, the gate was closed now. My only option was to proceed into the house that normally holds the wheelchair blunderbuss ambush. Killing the rifleman in here told me that I leveled up. Hit points went up by 26, my insight gauge went up to 1, and I didn't immediately realize, but my melee attacks were now doing more damage. Through this house was another shortcut lever to open a gate, just like in Bloodborne. Then, the only way forward was, unmistakably, a boss arena that looked not like cleric beasts, but gas coins. The boss was... neither. The first boss in Yarnum's Field is Tiny Dark Beast. Count the headlights on the highway. Now, because I'm an absolute goblin, I started taking pistol shots at him and realized his AI had not yet turned on as I peppered him from the entrance. Bullets did 25 apiece and looked like it would take exactly 10. But then I remembered I was filming footage for y'all, not just trying to get this game beat, and I stepped in to get a little sense of the actual fight. 
I aggroed the boss and was able to easily backpedal his attacks. The only move I saw him use was a forward lunge, much like the werewolves, which was then counter-attackable. Melee attacks actually did less than pistol shots, but it only took me two more hits to finish off the tiny dark beast. You hunted. With some cheese, fully within the rules, mind you, I've done my first boss hitless. My prize was a single blood vial. Felt like a ripoff. I feel like 10 to 15 bullets would have been more appropriate. I walked forward into a building that looked like it was going to be Odin Chapel, and then I reappeared somewhere not Odin Chapel. There were burning pyres, and I heard the patter of enemy footsteps below. It was a madwoman dancing around in circles. We are in Hemwick. You know what's weird? This platform is called Dreams, but this game actually feels like a dream. The way the levels are similar but so different from the corresponding areas in Bloodborne, there are recognizable landmarks and you proceed in the same general direction, but if you try to remember the path, there will be new walls up and illogical dead ends like that gate blocking off the Cleric Beast. You can only proceed on vibe. After I had gone to the approximate location of Cleric Beast, to an arena that looked like gas coins, my boss fight was actually Parl, and then the next area was Hemwick. It all makes perfect sense, in dream logic. For entering the new area, the game did not give me any blood vials, but it did reset my bullets to 20, so it turns out that lighting up the boss might actually have been optimal play. Nice. Now mechanically, I didn't really see a need for this bullet refill. It's not like there were enemies who needed bullets to kill that the game was safeguarding that we had enough for. In fact, the other way around was true. I think they should have guaranteed a minimum blood vial count for new areas since there's no way to farm these. Medwomen took a slight timing adjustment to learn. Their attack had more frontal range, and they also liked to do this weird gesture before attacking sometimes as a fake out. Then I reached something problematic, a whole host of mad women reveling in a crowd. My first thought was to try using bullets like pebbles to pull one at a time. This did not really work. As we saw with the boss, aggro is determined by your distance to them, not whether you've done them damage. But by timing my shots, I was able to make some bullets double count and pierce two at a time. My goal was just to reduce the melee burden since this could get ugly. I managed to pull one and handled her in melee, then I quickly learned that not all women are equal, which sounds bad out of context. Cause the second one, T-posing and spinning in circles, was really more of a turret than an enemy. If she catches you in her sightline, she throws a Molotov. I really like this design, I think environmental hazards are a really fun sometimes food in a Souls-like that lean the combat just a little bit more towards something like Hades. It's around now that I discovered that healing is not just your full bar, it does a flat 100. Healing with 26 hit points or fewer was full value, but healing from 27 or more is throwing away value. That's easy to avoid so long as everybody's hitting for 26 damage or less. I cleared that crowd and did an irreversible jump down. This designer again showed their skill now, an item pickup for 5 blood vials, without a blinking neon sign saying, hey, scrub, I know you just took damage in that fight, so here are some heals to replenish you. They essentially still did that, just with a little more tact. Another small fight, and I leveled up again, this time doubling my max hit points. Another pickup gave me 4 or more blood vials, cause the max turned out to be 20. Weird that blood vials have a max when bullets don't. As long as I hover near 20 blood vials, I have the privilege of healing up before grabbing any items in case they give us more blood vials that would otherwise go to waste. Then, all of a sudden, another dreamlike transition. We're back in the sewers of Yarnum? Lights bounce off a wet brick and a big rat paces the waterway below. There's also a door here, which I'm surprised to discover actually opens and leads out to a spot early in the Hemwick level. A shortcut I didn't see coming, and one we're about to need. Rats were one of the hardest enemies to duel in this game because they subvert what you've learned so far of Yarnum's Field's battle system. They strike and back off very quickly, so it's much harder to do that forward and back dance that enemies have taken so far. I could get some hits on them when they turned around, but overall rat fights were messy. I should have been using bullets for these. Then, my first death of the run. Not to a rat, but to falling into an invisible hole in the watery floor. This sucked at the time, but it's a very Kingsfield move. I feel like there couldn't not be cheap deaths like this in something called Yarnum's Field. They're just reminding me what I signed up for. Enemies respawn, of course, and I would normally have no issue fighting them again, except that with all the item pickups already picked up, it's definitely blood vial negative to fight, so instead I slipped through and fortunately everyone's aggro dropped pretty quickly. The radius feels pretty fair, something like 20 yards. Luckily, that shortcut door we just opened cuts the run back to just a couple of seconds. Okay, developer. I see you. 
It's at this point that I notice many of the items I've been picking up are actually coming from dead bodies. They really just looked like fuzzy starfish, something I did not think to question because fuzzy blobs are such a dream staple, but yeah, that's supposed to be a slumped over tri-finger butthole situation. I continued to amass bullets, stacking well beyond 20. My actual recommendation would be to mostly favor gun kills when you can. Every melee encounter you avoid has a positive expected value on your blood vial count, so yeah, use bullets if you have them. But I didn't know this, so you're gonna see me stockpile like crazy. The area widened out and I was suddenly in about the spot where a man-eater boar would be in Bloodborne, so I was ready for an encounter. Turns out the environmental clues were right. It is boss time. This one is an original creation, the Witch Hunter, which due to the hyphenation, I wasn't sure if the implication was that this is a hunter who is also a witch, or a hunter of witches. She had an affinity style delayed orb spell, a melee attack with her candle, a swipe with her free hand, and could also blow fire out to a good distance in front. I didn't get the chance to see much from the first boss, but the diverse moveset of this Witch Hunter was truly impressive considering the animations and balancing effort. Strafing melee attacks were mostly the key here. I took a few hits, but by this level my melee attacks had meaningly outpaced my bullets and damage, so it didn't even make sense to try and hang back to shoot her. For the second time, you hunted. Proceeding forward again, set my bullets to 20, which was actually a loss this time, and set me down in a new area. Last time it took me a second to recognize Hemwick, so this time I was excited to try to guess the new zone. Let's see, brick hallway, small rooms off to the sides. Could this be the church cells after the Ludwig fight? The end of the hallway had stairs bending up to the left and confirms it. This was absolutely the church cells. Yarnum's field, despite being modeled very simply, was amazingly true to the source, and it was really easy to pinpoint the areas from Bloodborne that we were meant to be in. And yet, there's something off about this area. It's not lined with patient beds. These are lab equipment? Cages? Jars of eyeballs? This was the lecture building, but it's also the church. This creator had been mimicking Bloodborne areas before now, but here they actually blended two areas into one, keeping aspects of both, and somehow even keeping the geometry of both, while making something entirely new and fascinating. I'm happy they had the confidence to editorialize a little. There were no nuns waiting to ambush me in the cathedral area, but there were doors off to the side leading to science rooms. The enemies in this area were remixed too. They had the body and squelchiness of pale blood students with the meatball heads of astral clock tower patients. Some of them carried a little rosemariness and attacked with a spray. I loved this combination lecture church that Yarnumsfield has imagined. I know I've dwelt on how dreamlike this game feels. This area, more than any others, triggered that feeling of being somewhere familiar yet alien. After climbing some stairs, I ended up in the lecture church second floor, looking very much like the normal lecture building second floor. Students line both sides of the mezzanine with shelves and a bridge to force you to zigzag. Pass through this one door and... Purple skies. Narrow wood panel hallway. This has to be Upper Cathedral Ward. Sure enough, about two seconds later, a werewolf pops through a window confirming my guess. We will be in the Upper Cathedral Ward later. For now, we go up and down a few staircases, turn a corner, and... What the heck? An NPC hunter? This guy's got the cost parasite broccoli head and a freaking cannon in his left hand. This is a marked step up from the other non-boss enemies we've had to fight so far. Due to a minor skill issue, I took a cannonball in the face for a full 100 damage. Yikes. That has surprisingly quick reload speed. I altered my strategy to avoid cannon hits at all costs. Yet I still wanted to bait them because they gave better openings to attack. After dishing out entirely too many hits, I finally slew this guy and for the first time collected a new weapon. He dropped not his cost parasite, but his cannon for my left hand. This could finally be the push that I need to spend bullets. But both of us know I still won't do that. Still, the cannon was well paced since the pistol by now has kind of fallen behind in damage. Then at the top of these stairs, this has got to be a boss arena. It's looking like Lady Maria and Vicar Amelia, though by now I know this game is going to give me whatever boss it feels like giving me. I'm just hoping for no Abriatus since I know there's a pretty well designed Abriatus creation going around in dreams somewhere that they may have imported. Well, turns out it was nothing. This room is a tease. We just need to hit a lever to open a pathway behind one of the statues. Now on my way to the lever, I see some suspicious runes on the ground. I correctly identify that these will hurt me, and yet, for science, I just had to step on one to confirm. Yup, that's a trap. Don't step on those. With that pathway open, I proceed out to the Celestial Emissary Arena. Oh boy, keep that cannon ready. If it's going to be the Celestial Emissary fight, I want to test out some explosions against groups of enemies. And the boss is... Living Failures, the other boss comprised of multiple blue dudes. 
I mean, I get it. They're easy to conflate. These guys individually were not hard to duel, but of course, kiting multiples at once changes the math. I noticed they weren't taking damage, but I had a hunch that killing them might decrement the boss hit point bar, and that was exactly the case. Each death is worth one boss damage, and it looks like the boss has 10 hit points. It's a pretty decent way to implement this fight, honestly. Now these failures don't spawn in a stream like in the Bloodborne fight. Instead, they seem to spawn in waves, allowing you to kill off all of them before more come in. Wave 2 had 3 melee guys, plus introduced one caster variant. The melee guys guarded the caster pretty well, but I discovered you can get multi-credit for attacking both at once. The risk there is they can also layer up attacks. It's a dangerous gambit. Twice during this fight, the failures started channeling that meteor summoning move, which only did seem to affect the grassy area. Meteors fall from the sky while the failures leave themselves open to attack, if you can stay safe from meteor range. Then the final wave of failures had two melee guys and two casters. If the goal was to increase difficulty as the fight goes on, they were actually doing it wrong. The spell guys were much easier to avoid than attacks from the melee failures. After the 10th failure slain, you hunted, and I gained my third level for another 126 to my max HP. The way out of this arena was not to crash through the window like in Bloodborne, no. Instead, there was a suspicious lawn chair holding a chalice. Could this be Wolnir? I was waiting for Yarnumsfield to decide it wanted to dilute the IP by adding in Dark Souls 3 content. But no, I actually think the chalice was more to evoke chalice ritual imagery. This transition was amazing. The room quickly flooded, and I wondered if I had fallen for another trap as the water closed over my head. Then, I wake up. What is the wettest spot in Bloodborne? The fishing hamlet, of course. It's nice of them to introduce a single fishman enemy at first for me to get the hang of fighting it. And, uh, they're real tough to duel. With a nice flat arena and no terrain to get caught on, they are pretty much manageable, but this is a tough enemy class to fight hitless if the conditions are anything less than perfect. Avoiding their attacks is not easy and requires some quick strafing. If you've only been doing back and forward attacking so far, these fish will force you to try and get a handle on the left to right strafing. It's in this fishing hamlet that Yarnumsfield hits its inflection point in difficulty. See, your max hit points do go up with each level you gain, and that's great. Enemy damage goes up too, as you'd expect. But blood vial healing does not, and there's still no way to farm blood vials. Up until now, enemies were easy enough to kill, and my blood vial income was enough to keep up with the hits that I took. But there's a dramatic turn in the fishing hamlet, and blood vials are now on a sharp decline. It didn't seem like the game recognizes this, because it stopped handing out those batches of 4 or 5 blood vials that sustained me in the earlier tough areas. Now I can't tell if this was intentional late game difficulty scaling, but every other sign in this game has pointed to a competent, knowledgeable developer, so I'm giving benefit of the doubt. I think they want you to hit a local maximum of power level in the previous area, then start falling behind the difficulty curve in the later levels, barely clinging to life by the end of the game. That said, pick your battles carefully in the fishing hamlet. There's pressure to kill enemies to hit your level ups, but running your blood vials to empty is a sure way to lose. Fishmen oracles, who in Bloodborne are not a real enemy, but more of an environmental hazard, they spout homing black skulls at you, but if you run up and hit them once, they stop. Well, in Yarnum's field, those oracles are actual enemies with an aggravatingly high hit point pool. I did find a chest containing my third and final left hand weapon for the game, a Rancor Cannon. This has the same model as the cannon. This thing is essentially just a hunter tool. It casts the same flying skull effect that the Fishman Oracles are using. I never really got to compare cannon damage to Rancor Cannon damage side to side, but I have to assume the later weapon should do more. A little further on, Yarnum's Field introduces the Lightning Caster Fishmen. Like in Bloodborne, these are no problem as long as you keep moving, but I got caught in this nasty room trying to kill a Lightning Caster while an Oracle was crapping in skulls from another rooftop, and something kept affecting my movement while clouding my vision with eels. I identified the eel problem a minute later. It's a levitating sphere of eels, vaguely scrotal- Those are balls that seems to just unavoidably hit you with its eel spell. This is one enemy I think the game could have benefited from introducing to you in a calmer environment so you can learn how it works. The way it went down for me, I had no clue what was doing this eel effect to me while I was fighting a totally different encounter. I died my second time this game from falling off a pit as I desperately tried to strafe kill just one of the casters ruining my day from all sides. Since aggro seems to just work off a naive range check, there are some nasty spots in the hamlet where multiple caster enemies are harassing you through the walls. With no shortcut yet opened, and only 8 blood vials, and a gauntlet of highly damaging enemies between me and progress, I did my best to sprint through the level up to where I was. 
This version of the fishing hamlet is quite a maze with much more weaving in and out of houses and up and down staircases, but I finally recognized I was making progress when I reached a house with an eel pit in the floor, a telltale sign that I'm approaching the latter parts of the hamlet. Just past here, I actually discovered a ladder to kick down and open a shortcut back to the start, barely past where I had died. It's an auspicious shortcut in case I'm gonna have to make reps against the boss with zero blood vials in hand. I clambered through one final house that ambushed me with an eel ball sack, then found myself facing a desolate coastline. It is obvious boss time. This boss was another original creation, the Watery Visitation. This guy was really cool. They didn't want to quite retread Orphan, so what they gave instead was a kind of Ludwig Phase 2 with the spells of Celestial Emissary, shaped in the eldritch mushroom form of Emrakul or that nasty thing from .hack. His quick meteor cast was the move that I loved to see. It fires just a few meteors in an easily avoidable cone, giving the chance to rush his feet and give him a slash. He had another move that I didn't understand at first. It looks like he's charging his sword, but actually this move sends out a little dark sphere with a sort of buffeting tornado effect on your movement. This move was also a great chance to hit him, but it's important to run away so you don't get tagged by the sphere. Attacks from his Holy Moonlight Blade were devastating if you got hit by them, but he only ever initiates that if you're already close up. So ideally, you just hang out at mid-range and rush in to punish when he casts a spell. Unfortunately, as the fight continued, we inched closer and closer to the lethal cliff. I wish you would step back from that ledge, my friends. Towards the end of his health bar, he picked up another move, this massive overhead meteor storm, like the previous boss had. He levitated up for the cast too, so I wasn't able to sneak in hits even if I risked dodging the meteors. He also picked up an overhead sword smash move, but I only saw this one time. I just kept punishing the fast meteor move and the sword charge and finally hunted on zero blood vials, zero bullets. At least I got a free heal afterwards from leveling up. This point has got to be the end of the game though, right? But where are the credits? There's another chalice at the end of the world. My heart sinks. How are we going to make progress now with zero blood vials? Well, it helps that we're done fighting fishmen, that's how. Seriously, those things were overtuned. I'm actually able to scrape by and use just about as many blood vials as I gain for the rest of the game. It just so happens that I hit equilibrium around the zero blood vials mark. I have great news though. You recognize where we've warped to, don't you? We are in the Thumerian Labyrinth, a chalice dungeon. What a troll move to include this after their Orphan of Koss analog fight. As a chalice enjoyer myself, I'm actually really tickled by this. Of all Chalice Dungeon enemies, they've chosen Scorpions as the common foe for this new area. They are mercifully easy to bait and dodge, and they don't even do tremendous damage if you mess up. But hitting them is very tricky. Their hitbox just does not match up very well with our Saw Cleaver. The first direction I tried to go in here led to a closed gate, so I gotta look the other way for a lever to open this. After a few more scorpions, I level up once again, which does feel very soon. Maybe I was at level 3.99 when we killed the watery visitation and he leveled me up all the way to like 4.99 for these scorpions to just put me at 5. But I think mostly what I learned here is that worrying about killing fishmen for XP is really not that important. It honestly might be optimal to just run through the fishing hamlet grabbing loot and avoiding enemies. If you need to make it here first, then just die and farm scorpions a few times to catch up on levels, that's much more manageable and it won't drain all your blood vials. That's assuming that XP works how we think it does though, the numbers are all invisible in this, so I'm going on assumptions. I reached a very recognizable chalice dungeon room layout, that big chamber with stairs down on both sides that usually has a lever or sarcophagus at the bottom middle. But this room had no lever, only a headless knight, Vengarl style. He had a nasty sword, but thankfully died easier than that previous NPC hunter. He did not drop a weapon though. Then what's that little pitter patter running in the door? It's an eyeball grandma. For the first time in a while, an enemy who was pretty easy to kill. I could have done with some more of these. Out this door, I can finally see the lever that I need down below to open that gate. I just have to find a way to get down there first. Railings block an easy descent via gravity. Blocking my way around the balcony, this enemy was the worst part of this whole game. I still have absolutely no idea how you're supposed to counter these Hermaeus Mora things that levitate and cloak you in black fly swarms. Visibility goes to crap and it affects your movement too, while your health just gets ticked down quickly but inconsistently. I couldn't tell if the flies were dealing the damage or just crowd controlling me while a different attack was doing the damage. My third death was to this nonsense. It occurs to me while scripting this that cannon fire probably would have solved this problem better. I will let you test that out. On the run back to where I died, I found a passageway that I had skipped before and actually found a chest here containing our first new right hand weapon. It's the gothic sword. It's the weapon that that headless knight was actually using. 
This thing seems to have greater damage and a very generous range. It seems to just be strictly better than the saw cleaver. Down the stairs toward the lever, I can hear a trap echoing. The telltale sound of axes swinging. A classic chalice dungeon trap. There's one more eyeball grandma past the axes, then a hidden item under the lever platform that generously got us up to six blood vials. This is finally the gift that I needed to feel like I wasn't running on fumes. Let's just pull the lever to unlock the gate and... It's trapped. In two waves, big rocks fall from the ceiling and steal some hit points from me. I was trying to figure out why they felt the need to put an unavoidable trap on a required progression lever. Then I remembered, because screw me, it's Kingsfield, that's why. Faced with backtracking and me being at low hit points, the correct move here would have been to just intentionally die for the teleport and the free heal. Instead, I hoofed it back since I'm enjoying the scenery, only to die anyway to the scorpion at the very beginning of the level. Hey, it's been a minute since we faded into a different Bloodborne area, hasn't it? Well, good news. Through the Chalice Dungeon Gate is a very sudden new area, this time looking like Mensis. There's one more scorpion problematically guarding a very narrow walkway, then we're fully out of the Chalice Dungeon scene. The next enemy we encounter up here is another Hermaeus Mora. With the Gothic Sword, I'm able to kill this one a little more efficiently, but the 330 hit points it stole from me still felt pretty much unavoidable. There's a human foe standing up here past that, but he doesn't look like Mikolash. No, this is a swordsman, much more closely resembling Gortash. He's got a long sword, and he likes to use the tiny Tonitris to cast a line of lightning when we're at a medium distance. I died again in this duel due to a skill issue, and because I was reluctant to spend any blood vials knowing how few we have. On the next try, I just hit him a bunch. One time, I even landed double hits on him in a single swing, which was kind of cool. Probably not the intentional design, just an idiosyncrasy of the hitboxes. And after a long time attacking, Gortash finally goes down, and sadly, like the Headless Knight, does not drop a weapon, despite really feeling like this one would. Some foes in this game could probably deal with having a few less hit points. At this point, we're pretty high up in the Mensis parapets. It sure feels like a boss is coming soon. The area starts to resemble Dark Souls 2's Salt Fort to me, but as with the Wolnir Chalice, I think I'm a little too eager to spot Dark Souls things. The game truly has been faithful to just Bloodborne. In the inky darkness, I can only assume forward is the correct direction. Well, someone forgot to build a handrail because I tumble forward to my death. This falling death, like the waterhole in the sewers, feel like the dev just having a laugh at our expense and going, teehee, Kingsfield. So next time I make it up here, I tiptoe along until I notice a dim candle off to the right, telegraphing some stairs in the darkness. There's a set of two cage elevators up here. Sadly, it looks like the one going down from here does not operate, so there won't be any hidden path to the Mensis brain. But the elevator up does work, complete with a rotation, and we're suddenly on a rooftop that looks terrifyingly logarius y Well, this fight is not him, but another lanky, dark blue humanoid. The Queen of Wriggling Blood. I waste no time running in and chopping this woman. The gothic sword is actually doing excellent damage here. She's also been real easy to dodge so far, as her blood beams miss overhead as long as you're up close. She's got one cool move that summons swords from the ground as an environmental hazard, some kind of blood fountain AoE attack, a shotgun of blood that she releases from above her head, and a basic swing of her sword which is very damaging if you allow it to catch you. The fight's going well, and I assume this has to be the end of the game, so I started working in Rancor Cannon shots at the end just to get a little more use out of that thing before the credits. This was a bad idea. The two seconds of immobility you incur to cast Rancor is really not something you can afford to do. Guns really are for basic enemies more than bosses in this game. Since guns were not helping, I reverted to swordplay for the end. Then, right before she died, QWB did something heinous. She cast a cloud of black flies, just like those Hermaeus Mora enemies. Blindly, I swung my sword, hoping to deal her the final damage before I got overwhelmed with no vision and no hit points. And luckily, through the swarming dark, you hunted. In the quiet aftermath, I poked around on the rooftop looking for perhaps another chalice to continue on, or waiting for a thanks for playing screen. What finally happened, I'm not sure how to interpret. Finally a cutscene starts, we look up at the full blue moon, then down, a crow hunter has shown up. Back at the moon, back down to the crow. Crow hunter raises their gun, kind of in our general direction, and pulls the trigger. My interpretation is, best guess, that this crow has been hunting us the whole time and finally caught up with us here. Hunter becoming the hunted or something vague like that. It's not too different from Garman executing you at the end of Bloodborne. And that was Yarnum's Field. This game is worth money. Easily I would have paid $15 for this experience on its own, but this was all done for free on Dreams and played by all of 60 people. 
Yes, it's basic contrasted with Bloodborne itself, but for the platform, this game is an absolute masterpiece and it's easily alone worth the price of owning a copy of Dreams. That's something I really want to emphasize. I'm sure this looked basic to a lot of you who are motivated by high production values, but to create this level of work in Dreams is absolutely jaw-dropping. It's very much an artistic choice to work in a limited medium like this, but it's exactly that, working within the ecosystem of Dreams that makes me appreciate Yarnum's Field so much. Shout out to the creator, Malice Emeth, and to the artist of many of these assets, Holt3037. I checked out Malice's profile within Dreams, and in the comments section, as recently as a week ago, someone had asked if they planned on making further updates to Yarnum's Field, and they actually responded that they might be making a new game soon, so they're clearly still active in the community. All I can say is, I truly pray that you do, and that more people give your work a shot. It's amazing what you've pulled off with this, and you have really strong design instincts. I wish you the best. Yarnum's Field felt downright cozy, like I was in the hands of a master, as soon as I got a little ways in and felt that I could trust the game to be designed well. It was little things, like telegraphing an item to show where I'm headed, or replenishing blood vials after the bigger enemy clusters, or pacing the shortcuts well so that tough enemies and trap deaths were not depressing. These aspects showed me that the creator really understood Soulsy level design and has a good degree of skill. On top of that, the combat was fun. Simple, again, yeah, but I liked how for each enemy you have to slightly adjust your timings and your approach, and handing out a few new weapons as the game progressed gave me new ways to interact with encounters. Of the five bosses, two were fully original, and I honestly thought those were the two most fun bosses as well. The other three were still well designed, and I think they hit an appropriate degree of making use of the source material while innovating. I will not make any criticisms of this game, because I'm pretty sure anything missing is just due to this being a one-man project on a niche platform and not for actual lack of effort, but I will say what I'd like to see next. And that would be a couple of branching paths. The levels in Yarnum's Field are very linear, and the Souls-like exploration is one thing missing from this formula that you otherwise pretty much nailed. It has always been my dream to cover weird games on this channel. Heck, my earliest YouTube videos ever are actually me playing random games on Dreams. Along the way, I got niched down somewhat into Souls games, and I'm so happy that I finally found a way to combine those interests and present Yarnum's Field to y'all. Please, if you own a copy of Dreams, go check this one out and give it a thumbs up. The world needs more work like this, and that's a very good way to show some love. Speaking of, thanks to y'all for watching this video. I've been loving revisiting Bloodborne so much recently, and I'm kind of obsessing. Surely next video has gotta be a different IP, right? Something that will be the paragon of gaming content. Thank you so much to my patrons who make it possible for me to cover little games like this in between the big videos. Links to Patreon and my Twitch below if you would like to further support the channel. A like and a comment on this video do go a long way as well, and I read every single one of them. Take care, everybody. Is what I would say. P.S. 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 Yeah, there's more video. I launched Yarnum's Field again to get some more B-roll for this video, and it actually turns out this game has a form of New Game Plus. Launching it a second time let me start over with my weapons and levels from last game, and the Gothic Sword was one-shotting early game enemies. I won't cover New Game Plus too much, as I can't tell whether it's actually intentional or just a side effect of how Dreams works and they forgot to reset your data, but yeah, I was able to do a New Game Plus. Alright, that's about it. Thanks.